Good morning. Beautiful day. Quite a week we've been in this week. We are in the book of Revelation. It seems more fitting all the time. As we walk through life, we know the coming of the Lord is close. And you can feel it, can't you? If you're a believer and you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, that is your hope. That is our hope. That is my greatest hope. The Lord can return right now, anytime. But until He does, He has a purpose for us, for His church. That's you and I. He's got a purpose for us to be impactful for Him in this world. This week, our nation has been turned upside down. It's, it's political parties so, so opposite, no common ground. It's believer, unbeliever. It's, it's, there's, a, there's a schism in our culture that is huge. There's a chasm in our culture that's huge right now. And it seems like there's no common ground at all. How do we handle that? How do we handle that in the context? It's a real challenge for believers. I want to encourage you as you're on social media with everything that's going on. Be careful. Use your testimony for Christ well. Be careful what you say. Convey Christ in your attitude, in your words, yes, but in your attitude, what you write, how you write, how you communicate, what you say. So important. Our online presence is, is exceedingly important now. Our life presence is so important. I shared this with you earlier. I just laid this resource before you again as we, as we are in Revelation. Just evangelism is exiles. It's a book that will just change your, change your thinking. It will it'll just, I believe, help realign your thinking uh, with the Word of God. We are exiles in this world. We don't belong in this world. We feel that tension all the time. But the thrust of the book, because the thrust of the Word of God is this, how do we, how do we function as exiles in this world, keeping our eyes on eternity, and yet making an impactful influence here in this, in this world now, showing grace, showing love, showing truth, when we're marginalized as Christians, that's going to happen. We have an administration now that, that doesn't have those biblical values. They're not going to reinforce biblical Judeo-Christian values. They're not going to reinforce principles from the Word of God. How do we function in that culture and that society? We do it with truth. We do it with grace. We do it in relationship. We do it in such a way that we convey Christ first, not politics first. We do it in such a way that, that we reveal the character of Christ in our life. I think this book will challenge you. I just encourage you, if you don't have it, to get it, to read it, uh, to just be challenged by it. Again, we are in the book of Revelation. We just finished chapter 2 and 3. Today what I want to do is, is I want to kind of take a summary thought. I want to I look at these two chapters again. This is the church age. This is the age in which we live. The challenges that these churches faced had different names, different nations, uh, different groups, but the challenges were the same. The challenges uh, of adversity, of hardship, of suffering, of, of just the challenges of being faithful to the Lord, those are the same things that the church deals with today and now. You know that now as you've gone through this week, as you've gone through COVID, as you've gone through all these things. May God help us to be strong. So we're going to take a summary look. What I want us to, what I want us to pull from, from these uh, chapters again in review, but, but add some layers to it is this, is really the emphasis of the message to these seven churches is consistent with the message of the Word of God into our life. Really what the scriptures implore and show us is we are in a life-to-life -life relationship all the time. No matter what we do in life as believers, no matter what's a part of our life, no matter what the blessings, no matter what the opportunities, they all they all filter down to and are built on the foundation of relationships. How are the relationships in your life? Well, that's, the I think, the challenge of these verses. I want to show that to you today. Let's look at that. We have had a grid that we've laid across the hearts of our people here at Emmanuel for a number of years. I want to show you that grid. I want to show you it in context of Revelation here. Let's look at this emphasis here. God desires for us to have a life that is in relationship continually, constantly, every day. What does that look like? What does that mean? May God help us. May he give us insight today. May he speak to our heart. May he impress upon us what's the most important. So here we are. Let's take the first element. There's going to be four elements we're going to look at today. The first element uh, there's two pieces to that. We see that relationship with the Lord, relationship is first and foremost, it's vertical. It is a vertical relationship. It is me and God. It is God and me. That's where it starts. That's the beginning. Christ initiates relationship into our life. He speaks into our life. The Spirit of God speaks into our life. The Word of God begins to penetrate into our heart. 
And by the grace of God, He moves our heart, the heart of an individual, so that we can receive Jesus Christ as Savior. So that by faith we can believe. It is a work of God. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is the one who initiates that relationship. He is the one who forges that relationship. He is the one who offers that to us. What does the believer do? Well, of course, we receive Jesus Christ. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning, that's the very first step. This is, it's, this is the first step that I'm looking at this morning. It's that vertical. Once you and I receive Jesus Christ as Savior, confess our sins, receive His forgiveness, step into a relationship, everything changes. Opportunities become eternal. We are now in a relationship with Jesus Christ. What does a believer do? We are in a welcoming relationship. We, from the moment of salvation to the rest of our life here on earth, every day we start the day and say, Lord, I welcome you into my life. As I welcomed you into my life as Savior, as I received you as Savior, as I let you change my life and step into my life and become Lord of my life, Lord, every day I welcome you. I welcome you into what I'm doing, into my priorities. God, I welcome you into my life. That's this first step. And so everything that defines these relationships is the love of God. We step into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the reason that we do, yes, is because it's the work of the Spirit. The reason that we do, ultimately, is because we fall in love with Jesus Christ. Have you fallen in love with Christ? Have you fallen in love with God Himself? Because Christ always points us to the Father. But the focal point of Scriptures is Jesus Christ, who then points us to the Father. He gives us, enables us to have a relationship with the Father. But it is a love relationship. That's what this is all about. We have a grid that we've used here. It fits here in Ohio. It's the O-H-I-O. We're not going to do it in order this morning. We're going to do it in order of how it fits with what is being revealed this morning. This first element of relationship is a heavenward relationship. It is, it is an element of worship. When I receive Jesus Christ, I step, into a, I step into a relationship where with humility of heart, I understand that I, that I have a relationship before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In humility, I have the opportunity to come into the very presence of God through Christ. And so worship begins. When I receive Jesus Christ as Savior, I understand that, that I can't save myself. And worship comes from my heart in that moment. And every day for the believer, worship then, then transforms our life. This is a worship relationship. This is a heavenward gaze of my heart, always looking to Jesus Christ every day. Well, what does it look like? The believer is to, is to welcome Jesus Christ. Every day we are to welcome Him. We see that here in these seven churches. Now, what I'm going to show you is this. Let's, start, let's begin here. Um, the believer in, in relationship with Jesus Christ, he has initiated that. We receive Jesus Christ. We welcome Jesus Christ into our heart, into our life. Every day we continue to do that. Not get saved again, but to welcome him. To say, Lord, you have full reign in my day today. Lord, you, have, you, you, are, the, you are at the forefront of everything I will do today. Would you lead me? Would you guide me? May I please you and honor you in everything. I worship you. God, my eyes are on you. My gaze is on you today. No matter what's on my schedule, my eyes are on you first and foremost. And so we are called, we are led, we are shown the importance of that here as Jesus writes to the churches, these seven churches and to his church, us. What do we see here? Well, in Ephesus, we see this. Now, you'll notice I'm going to be doing this. We have the chapter number here for each church, and then we have the verse that that thought is found in each chapter. So I want you to follow that. You don't have to write all these things down. I want you to listen, to, to communicate with your own heart, write what the Lord prompts. And then these are going to be on the screen. You can go back to them later. You can look at those. What I've done is I've is I paraphrased thoughts and put them on the page here. You can go back and say, wow, is this what it says? Let Do some scripture. Do some study. Let God bring it back into your heart. Meditate on the Word of God. We walk in Jesus Christ, we welcomed him because his presence, his presence is peace in our life. His presence is security in our life. We see that in chapter 2, verse 1, as he writes to Ephesus. We see in Smyrna, Jesus Christ rose and he died from the grave. We welcome Jesus Christ because he's the one who saves. He's the one who frees us from sin. He's the one who went to the cross in our place. He loved us sacrificially, unconditionally. We see, as he wrote to the church of Pergamum, that the Word of God itself, this is how this happens. It separates us from sin. It separates us to Him. When we are saved, we are separated into a relationship. 
We are separated. We are freed from the bondage of sin. And we, and we are given a relationship to Jesus Christ. We are free in Him. We, are see, we see here in these, in these scriptures that the Word of God, it, it, it separates us from the influence of sin. We, we come to hate sin. And we welcome Jesus Christ because we hate sin and see Him as the provision for sin, as the one who died for my sin. We welcome Him as strength into my life every day that this can continue to take place. When I wake up, I say, Lord, I welcome you so that this can be the reality of my day. In Thyatira, we see this. We welcome Him because ultimately we are accountable to Him. Verse 18. And so when we welcome Him, we're saying, Lord, I understand that. I accept that accountability. I want that relationship. And we understand in verse 26 that He is the one who rewards us. When we yield before Him and humble ourselves before Him in that, in that spirit of accountability, with that, um, with that obligation we have before Him to walk well, then He rewards that. He honors that. And so when we welcome Him every day into our life, we welcome Him so that these things might take place. Is this your mindset? Is this your heart? Is it your desire to say, Lord, these are the things I want to take place. And so I welcome you into my life. Not that I, not only did I just receive you as Savior, but every day that relationship continues. Every day that relationship starts. It's fresh. Every day I start with this passion, this commitment in my life. When he wrote to the church of Sardis, he reminds us that he gave us his spirit. We see the spirits there in verse, in verse 1, the seven spirits, the Holy Spirit. We've seen that. And He enables in our life what we cannot do. If I don't welcome Him, this doesn't take place. I won't see His enabling power come to fruition in my life. So I need to welcome Him and say, Lord, I'm Yours today. I want the Spirit of God to touch my life, to touch my heart, to move me, to lead me, to guide me. And so, Lord, I welcome that. Philadelphia reminds us that the Gospel is, is the source of life change. I welcome the Gospel. I welcome it into my life. He, is, he has the keys of David. He opens and shuts the doors. That's the gospel. That's all related to the gospel. And so I welcome him because he has the words of life. I welcome, I welcome him because the gospel is power. He opens doors. He shuts doors. He enables. He empowers. That's what he does here. And as he does that, he reveals and he shows you this morning how much he loves you, how important that is. Laodicea. We are reminded here in verse 20 of chapter 3 that he continually pursues us continually and he yes he disciplines us he reproves us but that is the that is one of the great great manifestations of his love for us he loves us so that we would be in right relationship with him when we welcome him we accept these things from the lord we accept relationship we accept his loving pursuit of us to draw us back into fellowship and to obedience with him and so the question is this the pursuit of this the passion is this for the believer lord i'm going to welcome you for you and i listening looking at the Word of God, this needs to be the commitment of our heart. What's the goal? The goal is a Christ-centered relationship. Ephesians chapter 3. I wrote, I wrote uh, these verses down this way for my heart. This is, this is what I wrote in my journal for me. I want to share it with you. It's simply a paraphrase. You go to the Scriptures here, you'll see the content here. But to me, this is a, this is a prayer. This is a passion for the believer. A Christ-centered relationship. To welcome Jesus Christ is to say this. Lord, I simply bow, I kneel before you. I bow my knees before the Father. That's humility. God, I welcome you in humility. Today I start. It's about you. It's not about me. Every day, God, in this relationship, it's about you. It's Christ-centered because Jesus always points us to the Father. In his ministry here on earth, he always pointed the disciples, those around him, to his Father. I do this so that I might know strength. And I might be strengthened with power through his Spirit, his Holy Spirit in my inner being. And so I listen to the Spirit of God. As I, as I humbly yield to the Father, the Spirit of God is engaged in my life. Strength is poured into my life. The Spirit indwells me. He is then activated in a powerful way in my life. When I, when I wake up, I start each day yielded before Him. And so Christ then is able to feel and be at home in my heart. Yes, He's there. He never leaves me. But our desire as a child of God is that He would be at home that we'd be yielded to Him, to His Spirit. And that happens as we simply exercise faith that is rooted and grounded in His love. Faith is just this, God, I believe You. I take You at Your Word. I believe that being in relationship is the most important, vital thing in my life. By faith, 
I have a follow through on that. So this first step is this. Christ initiates in our life relationship and the believer welcomes that relationship. That H there is heavenward, O-H-I-O, -O, okay? So the emphasis of the message of Jesus Christ to his church in these seven churches, in these two chapters, is simply this. It's about life relationships. It's about Jesus Christ initiating relationship into our life. That's what he has shown us in these seven churches. It's about the believer in response, welcoming, receiving Jesus Christ as Savior, but then welcoming that presence, the presence of Christ, every day. The second element of relationship still deals with this vertical element, this vertical relationship. We are in vertical relationship. Jesus Christ has initiated to the believer relationship. If you are a genuine child of God, he's touched your heart. You have received him as Savior. Now, this second element is this. Jesus Christ, not only did he initiate relationship, he continues to pursue relationship with you and I every day. There's not a day that goes by that Jesus Christ is not pursuing relationship with us. The believer, what are we to do? We as believers, we are to conform. We are to conform to Christ. We are to respond in that relationship to, to conform to the character of Jesus Christ. Again, love is at, the, is at the center of relationship. In love, I yield to his will. In, in love, it is about the will of God in my life. Jesus Christ was committed to the will of his Father because he was in a love, eternal love relationship with his Father. You and I, when we are in relationship with Christ, we love the will of God for our life. We love what he wants to accomplish for us. We are in a love relationship. This is, this is uh, the OHIO, this is that onward element. What starts at the moment of salvation continues until the day we go home to be with the Lord. It's, it's every day, all the time. So how do we see that in these, in these uh, chapters here in Revelation, conforming to Jesus Christ? Well, in Ephesus we see this. We conform because Jesus Christ, because we want to be diligent. We conform by being patient. We conform by hating evil, verse 2. We conform as we make Jesus Christ our identity. Our identity is Christ, not something else, not someone else. That's key. That's going to come up again. Smyrna, we conform by accepting weakness. We accept slander. We accept suffering. This is what Jesus Christ did. We conform to his image, to his character. We conform by, by trusting him, by being faithful, by not being afraid, verses 10 and 11 here in Smyrna. We conform because Jesus Christ is our identity. Boy, that what a challenge that is every day, all the time. No matter the cost. When I conform, I say, Jesus Christ, you will be my identity every day, no matter the cost. Now again, you can come back and look at these verses. I want to encourage you to do that. And we conform by, by hating sin. It's, input, it's influence, it's, it's hold on us, and we repent of that sin. When we repent of sin, we are conforming to Christ. We are yielding that bondage. We are yielding that fight to Him and saying, Lord, change me, make me right with you. We see here in the church of Thyatira, we, con we conform because we, we grow. We faithfully grow to the very end. That's the means in which we conform. We grow, we grow, we grow to the very end. We never stop growing. Never stop growing. We don't tolerate compromise. In this church, there was compromise. In my life, there might be compromise. In the lives of those around us, there might be compromise. As we conform to Jesus Christ, we don't tolerate compromise in our life. That's a challenge. That's a spiritual battle every day. Sardis reminds us that we conform to Jesus Christ. How do we do that? We wake up. By the Spirit of God, we wake up. We wake, out of, we wake up out of spiritual stupor. We listen to the Spirit of God. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. To him and to the churches. To wake up out of that spiritual um, apathy is to listen to the Spirit of God. When we listen, we find ourselves conforming to Jesus Christ. We live for Jesus Christ. Sardis had a reputation that was about themselves, not about Christ. He calls us not to, not to develop, develop and build our own reputation, build a reputation that is centered around Christ, not ourselves. Philadelphia reminds us, we conform by keeping God's word. By again, by emphasizing, making sure that Jesus Christ is our identity. What, what defines you and I? What, what, what is so important in our life that we want everybody to know? What is it that we talk about in our life more than anything else? Jesus Christ wants to be, needs to be, that identity for every believer. 
We need to plug into God's grace, into His power every day. Verse 8, chapter 3. Laodicea. We've got to be real with ourselves. We've got to be real, real with Christ. The believers here were not. So many believers, so many times we find ourselves in that place where in a moment in time, in a pattern of time, we're not real with ourselves. We're not honest with ourselves. We need to be refined before the Lord. We need to be right before the Lord. We need to examine our hearts before the Lord. Because Jesus Christ here in verse 20 of chapter 3 in Laodicea, He is constantly, consistently, daily for the believer pursuing us every day. Do you know He never gives up on you? you know He loves you so much that He pursues you every day? Do you know that no matter what the battle you have right now, no matter what the struggle you have right now, He loves you so much? He's pursuing you right now as you listen. He's pursuing you. He wants you to be in relationship with Him. He enables that too. We're going to see that. What's the goal? What's the goal of conforming? Well, it's, it's a Christ-centered transformation in our life. 2 Peter chapter 3. According to His promise, we are awaiting new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. But that's putting that true? He's coming. We're waiting that. And so, beloved, He loves us so much. Beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent. Be diligent to be found by Him. He's the one who's looking. He's the one who will examine. Be diligent to be found by Him without spot or blemish. We're not perfect, but in Christ we strive to be sanctified. We strive to be set apart for Jesus Christ. We, st we strive to have a, a clean conscience before the Lord each day. That we might be found when He returns to be without spot or blemish. To have sin confessed, to be walking with the Lord. And that we might found, be found to be at peace with the Lord. Because we're walking with Him in the midst of adversity and challenge. This is a life transformed. This is the life of one who is conformed to Jesus Christ. The second element here of life to life ministry is this. Christ is pursuing us and the believer is conforming to Christ. The O is, an on, is ongoing. Heavenward is the first one. Ongoing is the second one. What begins at the moment of salvation continues the rest of our life until we're with the Lord. We can never stop growing, never stop desiring to be set apart to Jesus Christ conforming to him now we step into the second element but the third piece is that horizontal relationship see life life is about relationships every day all the time whatever is pressing on our life beneath all of that the most important thing is relationships what's being highlighted here initially is my relationship and your relationship with God have you have you welcomed him into your life are you conforming your life to his character, to his image? That is that vertical relationship. Now, now we step into this horizontal relationship. Jesus Christ in relationship now enables relationship. He enables victory. He enables us to overcome. He enables wonderful things to take place in the context of relationship. And so what does the believer do? Because he enables, we serve. In response, we serve Christ. We serve him. How do we do that? Again, in relationship, we've already shown in that vertical element we love Him. Now that comes through in our life. In our relationships, we love, ultimately, number one, the body of Christ. We love fellow believers. We reach out and we are defined by the love of Jesus Christ in our life. With every believer we ever come into contact with, in some way, shape, or form, the love of Jesus Christ comes out of our response out of our life to them. This is an inward focus, O-H-I-O. This is, this is the, the focus, a biblical focus of the church to minister to one another, to be that witness and that testimony, John chapter 17, so that the world may know of Jesus Christ. That is key. That is our great testimony. It's how we love and serve one another. That is witness. That is growth. That is opportunity. So the response of the church, the response of the believer in this in this horizontal relationship is to serve Christ by serving the church. We see that here in Ephesus. We serve by applying God's word together. We stand together. We apply God's word together. We strengthen and we give hope to one another. It's not easy. It's a challenge. We give strength to one another. We remind and encourage one another of the hope that we have in Christ. We apply and we live out God's word, his love in our life. Verse 4. Smyrna reminds us that we reach out to those in need. And we support those who are suffering and hurting. It's, it's a given in your life. That there are the believers in your life are hurting and suffering at some point. Those who are most faithful are hurting and suffering. 
We need to be mindful. We need to be aware. No one is a rock. No one is an island on their own. We all need the encouragement of relationship in Christ with one another. We all need the community of Jesus Christ together. Pergamum reminds us. We are to encourage by, how do we serve? We encourage faithfulness. We encourage identity in Jesus Christ. That's how we serve one another. That's how you serve your family members. That's how you serve your friends. That's how you serve the church. All those who are in Christ, you serve them by reminding them of these things. We address, do you know this? We, we have honest conversations. We addressed compromise in our lives. We put it on the table and we encourage one another and we step away from that compromise. That's all part of these one another principles that we see in Pergamum that comes out. In Thyatira, we, we serve by encouraging ongoing spiritual growth. We expect it of one another. Is that how, is that, is that what you're wanting in your relationships from others into your life? Do we want these things into our lives? If we're genuinely walking with Jesus Christ, this is what we want. This is what we give. We call sinners to repentance. I want that input in my life. We need to be that to one another. Sardis reminds us, we're to be honest with one another regarding the dangers of spiritual decline. How many times we see people decline spiritually, we don't have the courage to speak into their life. We're afraid of breaking relationship. We're afraid of saying the wrong thing. We don't have the courage to, to, to pursue them as Jesus Christ pursues us. To really bring the truth, the authenticity, the integrity of a relationship with Jesus Christ, that challenge into their life. When we serve one another, we do that. Philadelphia reminds us that we pray. We pray for open doors. We pray for power. We pray for faithfulness. This is serving one another. We pray together. We pray for these things. We convey the strength of God's love. We emphasize, we show, we model, we expect the love of Jesus Christ to be modeled. Laodicea reminds us that we pursue. We pursue the one who's backslidden. We pursue, we pursue those people in love. We don't get fed up with them. We don't talk about how they've slipped. We don't, we don't set them aside. We don't, we don't make them projects in our life. We simply love them. We pray for them. We extend grace to them. As appropriate, we bring the discipline of the church at times. But that's only done in love. That's only done for the purpose of restoration. But, per, but individually in our lives, we pursue them because we love them. That's what we do. The goal, the goal of serving is to reflect Christ, is to have that Christ-centered mindset. Jesus Christ, even Christ, even the Son of Man, came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. It boggles my mind that Jesus Christ didn't come to this earth to be served the first time. It boggles my mind. He had every right to be served in every way. He created all things, you and I. We sh this world should have served him from the very onset. But he hid the glory of God. He lived among us and he instead served us. If anyone serves me, why does he do that? He's because he's following me. Where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. We serve Jesus Christ because we're following Christ. If I'm not following Christ, I'm not serving him. If I'm not following Christ, I'm not serving his church. If I'm not serving, I'm not in the community of Jesus Christ. I'm not benefiting the community, the body of Christ. He calls us to be impactful in sustaining, building, equipping the body of Christ. That is your role. That is my role. So this third reminder is this. Christ initiates, Christ pursues, Christ now enables. The believer welcomes that relationship. The believer conforms to the character, the image of Jesus Christ, and the believer serves Jesus Christ. How? By serving his church. By serving the body of Christ for which he died. You and I need to have a mindset or we're willing to be servants first. Or we don't have to be upfront. We don't have to be number one. We don't have to be in control. We don't have to be in charge. We humbly yield by serving one another. We are team players. We give so that Jesus Christ would be reflected. We serve so that Jesus Christ would be impactful. It's not about me. That's what all that's what happens here. 
The last element here is also reflects this horizontal relationship. Christ now offers relationship. He offers relationship. Well, we saw at the beginning, he initiates relationship. If you're listening and you are a child of God, that's what took place. He initiated relationship in your heart. Like he touched your he touched your heart. Your story is how he saved you. Your story is what he did, how he brought someone into your life, how he brought the word of God into your life, and your life changed. That's your story. It's the gospel having penetrated and now transformed your life. This is this is speaking to the church, but it's also speaking to you this morning who might be listening, who have never received Jesus Christ. He offers relationship. What is my obligation? What is our obligation as a church? Is to share Jesus Christ. It's to be a witness. Is to be a testimony. To be an ambassador for Christ is to be a living letter for Jesus Christ. Incumbent upon us, if we're to be defined by the love of Jesus Christ, we are now called to love all people. No matter who they are, no matter what they've done, no matter how difficult they are, we are called to be agents of the love of God into their life. In this culture that is that is so divided, the true church is called to be an agent of love in a world that doesn't know how to love or to show them Christ. That's a real challenge. OHIO, this is that outward focus. It's my mind driven towards those who need Jesus Christ. It's the heart of a soul winner. How do we see this in Revelation? Well, the believer's response in this relationship is to share Christ or to be ambassadors. What do we share? Well, in Ephesians, we have the peace of the sovereignty of God. He's in charge. He's in control. That brings peace. The peace of his presence. He's among his church. We share that. That's part of the gospel. That's what we share. We share his love, that he loves us continually. He calls us to love because he loves us. He gave his life for us. Smyrna reminds us, we share that our weakness, we share that our weakness is is his strength. He becomes strong when we are weak. We share our need. We share that we are the very ones who are in need of Christ. We share that every day we reveal every day that we need Christ. I can't make it through the day without Christ. I can't do what he wants me to do without yielding to him. I need Christ every day. That's part of the gospel. When we convey the gospel to someone who's in need, we share as well that we are people still in need. He's met the greatest need in relationship. He's given us a Savior, but every day I need Christ. If I convey to others that I don't need people and I don't need them and I don't need others, I've just, I, have, I, have, I have weakened the message of the gospel by my life. Pergamum reminds us in chapter 2, we share the power, the authority of his word over sin, over Satan, over us. The gospel is built upon the authority of Jesus Christ. His authority over sin, his authority over Satan, his authority over us. Thyatira reminds us that we're accountable. We're accountable before a God who is just and he is righteous. When we share the gospel, we share, we share this reality that Jesus Christ is just and to him we are accountable. And that he is righteous and he will always do the right thing. He cannot let sinners into heaven but he can let forgiven sinners into heaven. He can let those who are in relationship with Jesus Christ into heaven. We need to share that. That comes out of the church here in Thyatira. In Sardis, we share the reality of the book of life. Either we are in relationship with Jesus Christ or we're not. Either we're a child of God or we're not. We, he shares the beauty of eternal security here. It's once saved, always saved. I tell you what, that is biblical, that is truth. Philadelphia reminds us as we share the gospel, we share Christ. He is true. He is truth. I'm the way. I'm the truth. He is holy. We stand before Him. Sinners, we need Him. We need a Savior. He cleanses. He washes. He makes us holy. And He is the door. He is the way. He is the only way. Jesus reminds us that He's coming again. That is the gospel. Jesus is coming again. What a beautiful truth. Are you ready? Are you ready? You and I, believers... We need to be sharing these truths. We need to be sharing these realities. You need to be living in light of the gospel. If I believe this, if you believe this this morning, your life will reflect Jesus Christ. You will be faithful to Him. You will be faithful to His church. You will do what He wants you to do. You will be what He wants you to be. Laodicea reminds us when we share the gospel, we're sharing ultimately His authority. <clears throat> Simply the authority of His word alone. His voice and His word, His power, all that He does 
did and will do simply on the authority, the power of his spoken word alone. That's power. With his word, with the word of God, he changes lives. It is only through the word of God that we are saved. It is only through faith in the Savior who is revealed in the scripture that we are saved. There is no other. There is no other truth. There is no other way. It is found within the content of the Word of God. What's the goal? What's the goal for the believer who's committed to this? It's a Christ-centered, it's a gospel-centered life. Philippians chapter 1. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Everything, everything in your life, everything in your life ought to reflect the gospel. The power of the gospel, the reality that the, that the gospel touched and penetrated your life once upon a time, and it is still transforming, it's still changing you. You are changing every day because not only do you believe what Jesus did, you believe who he is and what he's doing. And you yield, you and I, or we are yielding to him every day because we believe the gospel. Let your life be changed. Be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How do you do this? Stand firm in one spirit together with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. We need each other to be strong. We need each other to be accountable. We need each other to sharpen one another, to encourage one another, to be agents of the gospel, to be ambassadors, to be living letters. Why? He reminds us because there's so many things out there that might that might just that make us afraid to be to be out courageous and bold. Don't be frightened in anything by your opponents. Second Second Corinthians five, Second Corinthians three reminds us we're to be ambassadors for Christ, we're to be a living letter. Fear is a reality. Jesus Christ, when we love him, perfect love casts out fear. When we love him the way we're supposed to, 1 John tells us, when we are in that love relationship, when we love others the way we are uh, called to love them, when we, when we truly love them, and we truly love Jesus Christ, and we love his word, love has a way of casting out that fear because it impresses upon us the urgency of the day. It impresses upon us the character of Jesus Christ. It impresses upon us the need of the one who is without Jesus Christ. And instead of fear being the, the, the emotion that, that is overriding, it is, it is the, the sense of passion, compassion for a lost person that we share. I, I need that challenge in my life. And so we see here, lastly and fourthly, Jesus Christ offers relationship. He initiates it. He pursues it with us. He enables it in our life. And he offers it to you who have not received, that you might receive Jesus Christ. In response, we welcome that relationship every day, not just at the moment of salvation. We conform to Jesus Christ daily the rest of our life. We serve him by serving his church, and we share Jesus Christ. We share Jesus Christ with the lost world. In relationship, over and over and over again, we see here in Revelation, it's reinforced by John, who wrote this book in 1 John, we overcome. For everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. When we overcome, we are faithful in all these things. When we overcome, we are, we are faithful in, in worship, in relationship. We are faithful in, in conforming to Jesus Christ. We are faithful in serving one another as a church. We are faithful in going to a world who needs Christ. Overcoming by the power of God enables us to have this passion, to follow through in victory, to reflect Jesus Christ. May that be your passion today. Jesus Christ is coming again. That needs to be our great motivation. That's a challenge. That is accountability. But that's our greatest reward and that's our greatest joy. I can't imagine anything greater than knowing that Jesus Christ might come. That we will be with him for all eternity. What, what a delight. What a life change. Not only for all eternity, for the future, but for now. May God have my attention. May have your attention. May he capture our hearts with his love. As he pursues us, may we respond back to him with this kind of life. A life that is his. Given to him for his glory, his purpose as reflected in his writings to the seven churches here in Revelation, to his church in Revelation, and to the church today. May we be that kind of church, 
as a corporate church at Emmanuel and as an individual member of his universal church, you and I. May that be true of us. God, God bless in your life. May he speak into your life. I want to encourage you to go back into these chapters. Go back into this message. Look, look at these chapters and say, God, that's what I want. That's what I want for my life. That's what you expect of me in my life. God, I pray, enable that in my life. Give me humility. Give me weakness to be strong in you. Give me the ability to follow after you. Lord, that's our prayer today. Bless your word into our life that we might follow after you as believers, that one listening might receive Jesus Christ as Savior by faith because of your word and the testimony of the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining with us. We'll meet again next week.